Paul Dukas's The Sorcerer's Apprentice, composed in 1897, is a musical composition based on a poem of the same name by 18th century German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Goethe was a product of the later Enlightenment. However, he had a profound impact on the uh, European 19th century and romantic culture and beyond. For instance, Dukas is only one of many composers inspired by Goethe's work in the 19th century. Goethe's Faust, for example, inspired operas by Charles Gounod and Hector Berlioz, as well as Franz Liszt's Faust Symphony. Goethe's The Sorcerer's Apprentice can be found in many versions online, its original German language, as well as in English translation. I've placed a link to the version of, that I used for my analysis as a reference, and I'll also offer a quick reading of that same poem now. The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translation by Edwin Zadel, 1955 That old sorcerer has vanished, and for once has gone away. Spirits called by him, now banished, my commands shall soon obey. Every step and saying that he used I know, and with sprites obeying, my arts I will show. Flow, flow onward, stretches many, spare not any, water rushing, ever streaming fully downward toward the pool in current gushing. Come, old broomstick, you are needed, take these rags and wrap them round you. Long my orders you have heeded, by my wishes, now I've bound you. Have two legs and stand, and a head for you. Run, and into your hand, hold a bucket too. Flow, flow onward, stretches many, spare not any, water rushing, ever streaming fully downward, toward the pool in current gushing. See him, toward the shore he's racing, there he's at the stream already, Back like lightning he is chasing, pouring water fast and steady. Once again he hastens. How the water spills, how the water basins, brimming full he fills. Stop now, hear me, ample measure of your treasure we have gotten. Ah, I see it, dear me, dear me, master's words I have forgotten. Ah, the word with which the master makes the broom a broom once more. Ah, he runs and fetches faster. Be a broomstick as before. Ever knew the torrents that by him are fed? Ah, a hundred currents pour upon my head. No, no longer can I please him, I will seize him, that is spiteful. My misgivings grow the stronger, what a mien his eyes, how frightful. Brood of hell, you're not immortal, shall the entire house go under? Over threshold, over portal, streams of water rush and thunder. Broom accursed and mean, who will have his will? Stick that you have been, once again stand still. Can I never, Broom, appease you? I will seize you, hold and whack you, and your ancient wood I'll sever, with a wetted axe I'll crack you. He returns, more water dragging, now I'll throw myself upon you. Soon, O goblin, you'll be sagging. Crash, the sharp axe has undone you. What a good blow, truly. There, he split, I see. Hope now rises newly, and my breathing's free. Woe betide me, both half scurry, in a hurry, rise like towers there beside me. Help me, help eternal powers. Off they run, till wet and wetter, hall and steps immersed are eyeing. What a flood that naught can fetter. Lord and master, hear me crying. Ah, he comes excited. Sir, my need is sore. Spirits that I've sighted, my commands ignore. To the lonely corner broom, hear your doom as a spirit, when he wills your master only cause you, then tis time to hear it. In summary, the poem is about an apprentice sorcerer and their master. Leaving the apprentice alone in the workshop to complete chores, uh, the apprentice becomes tired and bored of carrying buckets of water and decides to enchant a broom to help them. At first confident, the apprentice loses control of the broom, unable to break the enchantment that they cast. As the workshop begins to flood, the apprentice attempts to break the broom with an axe. The apprentice fells the broom, splitting it in half. However, to their horror, the two parts of the broom become animated by the same spell and start work once more, flooding the workshop at twice the rate. Finally, just in time, the master sorcerer returns and breaks the enchantment and the flooding of their workshop. 
Focusing now on Dukas' The Sorcerer's Apprentice composition, which is a programmatic symphonic composition, how does Dukas turn Goethe's poem into that musical piece? Moreover, how does the music reflect story elements within the poem, if at all? That's what we'll explore today. Dukas takes several details from Goethe's poem which guide many musical attributes such as the thematic material, orchestration and the overall structure and form of the piece. For example, Jean-Marie Grillo, in their uh, analysis of The Sorcerer's Apprentice identifies semblances of sonata form and several themes that parallel the story structure of the poem. For instance, in the introduction and exposition, Dukas introduces themes for The Water... The Broom, The Apprentice and the Sorcerer. Two main characters and themes are the apprentice and broom themes. The theme of the latter, the broom theme, dominates the piece. Moreover, in their analysis, Jean-Marie Grillo also identifies the orchestration of the broom theme on bassoons and contrabassoons to signify the grotesque. However, I also wondered if the orchestration choice of the bassoons was also for their physical resemblance to a broomstick poking out the top of the orchestra, sort of like a broom handle. The exposition in a three-part structure, the characters and story are established. Similarly, as we progress, the problem for our apprentice protagonist arises and the tension begins to mount. As the broom possessed takes to the chores diligently, it begins to flood the workshop. With this rising tension, Dukas can deploy techniques that are reflective of many development sections in other, even uh, the most traditional sonata forms, albeit dressing it in more contemporary harmonic and tonal structures. The development section is the section of harmonic adventures and large-scale tonal movement. Dukas, therefore, can create tension via harmonic dissonances, dualities and uh, abrupt tonal and uh, thematic shifts. For example, one of my favourite parts of this section features harmonic pedals against chords and melodic material that are at toned lods with one another. Note in the example on screen how the chords and melodies rarely use the same pitch as the underlying pedal point. In some, for instance, particularly for the A-flat pedal, they seemingly avoid reinforcing the pitch that the pedal point imposes. The technique creates not only a harmonic tension and dissonance, but a feeling of discombobulation as though the components of the music have become detached from one another. The other things that I like about this section are its clear emphasis on augmented triads, which are a staple of this piece, and how Dukas uh, develops and juxtaposes the broom and apprentice themes. A chord of limited transposition, the augmented chords create an unsettling and surreal sonority for this composition, and particularly this section. Similar to the diminished seventh chord, which is also used lightly in this passage, they are limited in transposition as you can spell them in several ways without the actual uh, pitch content changing. For instance, a D augmented chord contains the same pitches as an F sharp augmented or B flat augmented chord. Comprising stacked major thirds, where the diminished is made of stacked minor thirds, the identity of augmented chords is slippery. Distinct in sonority, but indistinct in function, perhaps this is where its unsettling and surreal nature lies in these oppositions. 
Alongside the disjunct of mentored harmonies and pedal point, Dukas also does some interesting things with the broom theme through the section. Each thematic statement transfigures the broom theme onto a new scale structure of whole tone quality. For example, in the first two iterations we get the two types of the whole tone scale. Similarly to the augmented chord, whole tone scales are modes or scales of limited transposition. For the final iteration of the broom theme, in the section over the E-flat pedal, Dukas juxtaposes elements of the whole tone and a minor third figure between D and F. The use of a minor third here is significant as it conflicts with the whole tone quality of the music uh, in the preceding parts of this section. It conflicts with the whole tone quality as one cannot construct minor third intervals in a whole tone scale. The dramatic shift swiftly imposes a different scale structure and sonority on this subsection and elevates the dissonance between the D and E flat. In the final part of this section, characterised by its use of a B flat and then D flat pedal point, Dukas juxtaposes a fragment of the broom theme with a version of the apprentice theme. Furthermore, while the broom theme slides into an upward sliding chromatic line that counterpoints the apprentice theme, the apprentice theme itself is presented as a desperately falling legato phrase. Not so rosy for the apprentice, the broom surges on with its work. What a good blow, truly. There he split, I see. Woe betide me, both half scurry. Grabbing an axe and felling the broom, the apprentice believes he has halted the broomstick, saving the workshop from being flooded. However, much to the disarray of the apprentice, two halves of the broomstick come back to life and continue to work diligently at twice the rate. To parallel this key plot point in Goethe's poem, Dukas splits the broom theme into two voices. At first, one half of the broom comes alive, represented by a fragment of the broom theme. When the second part joins, the two are one of the same and move in tenths, in similar motion. After this, the voices or the lines grow in independence and the energy begins to pick up again. For example, upon stating the broom theme in full on bassoons, the melody is counterpointed by a simplified version of itself in the pizzicato strings, which also present uh, the chordal accompaniment. The bassoons then take on a new line that uses motifs of the broom theme uh, to counterpoint another statement of the broom theme in the violas and clarinets. That texture becomes more clearly polyphonic. Both parts of the broom are now carrying out their work diligently with renewed vigour and independence. Following the contrapuntal section that we have just looked at, Dukas rebuilds towards an orchestral climax that juxtaposes and superimposes the main themes of the composition. It's the real high point of the composition as well. For example, bar 699 places the despairing apprentice theme against the broom theme once more. At first, the apprentice theme is on top, placed high in the texture and in octaves. After a few iterations in this arrangement, the roles suddenly reverse. The broom theme usurps the apprentice theme. Note in the following example how the apprentice theme starts in octaves at the top of the texture. The broom theme grows in resilience with each fanfare interjection before the themes switch in prominence. Following a handful of back and forths, a brief restatement of the sorcerer's theme precedes the orchestral climax. In one final plea for help, the broom and apprentice themes wrestle with each other one final time. Again, during this musical wrestle, the broom theme prevails and water floods the workshop.
Just as all hope is lost, the Master Sorcerer finally returns to clear up their apprentice's mess. The composition ends with a coda that is reminiscent of the piece's introduction. A programmatic symphonic composition, Paul Dukas's The Sorcerer's Apprentice, demonstrates many lessons for us all as composers. For example, the use of harmonic language by Dukas in the form of chords, such as the augmented chord, or scales, such as the whole tone scale, formulates a sonority that imagines the surreal and the magical. However, the most pertinent of these lessons is how Dukas uses literature, Goethe's poem, to structure and form his composition. Dukas takes Goethe's poem and not only traces its narrative musically, but he does so by creating and developing themes for crucial characters and the things in the narrative. He then creates symbolism by using musical devices such as the counterpoint of said themes, reflective of action within Goethe's poem. Alone these devices produce potent music, but with the text they represent something more meaningful. As always, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe for more and future content and give us any thoughts, questions or feedback in the comments section below. I am currently producing any old music's first online guided music composition course on Tintinabli technique. I am also considering opening up some slots for online one-to-one -one tutoring in music composition or other closely related subjects as well. To gauge interest in this, I've set up a short Google form where you can register interest. It's all informal and it's linked below.